Hello there and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name's Chris and today we're taking a look at the uh, Hawker Typhoon which was based at RAF Bolt Head June and July 1944. Have a look around, see what you think. There's lots to see and do. It was an amazing aircraft, one of the heaviest aircraft of the Second World War, top speed of just over 400 miles an hour, and it weighed six and a half tons. It was the heaviest single-seater fighter aircraft of the Second World War, weighing in at six and a half tons, compared to the Supermarine Spitfire, which was half that weight at just around about three and a half tons. It was capable of well over 400 miles an hour. It uh, needed to reach a speed of 130 miles an hour to take off, and it needed about 750 metres. Here are of RAF Bolt Head during the Second World War and also just after. It was an aircraft that could take any amount of damage, any amount of flak, and it would get you home. I had the distinction of being shot down uh, not far from Boulogne. I was really scared, really scared, scared stiff on many, many occasions. It happened more than once that a tail came off the machine and at that time nobody whose tail came off survived. At times I was shit scared. He said, well, you'll only be out an hour and a half. Won't take very long. In fact, it took just about 12 months. Here we are taking off at the former RAF Bolt Head airfield, heading east. You'll see soon we lift off, come out over the cliffs and make a right turn. If you were flying a Hawker Typhoon, you'd need 130 miles an hour before you took off. You'd need about 750 meters to reach that speed and take off. And uh, here you are climbing out over the cliffs uh, pushing up towards 200, 250 miles an hour, turning right now to go downwind, so we'll have the uh, runway on our right-hand side. Um, bearing in mind this aircraft was capable of cruising at over 400 miles an hour. Uh, it, it was a, a phenomenal aircraft with a Napier Sabre 2200 horsepower engine. Uh, turning a massive 14 feet diameter propeller. It was an incredibly powerful aircraft, one of the most powerful single seat aircraft of the Second World War. We're now flying along the coast, along the cliff dots with the runway and the airfield off to our right hand side as you can see in this image here. And we're gonna make a turn to try and line up for the runway Bearing in mind this aircraft now is doing well over 200 miles an hour and we need to get the, uh, the undercarriage down before we make this right turn to line up for the runway. And this is the view a pilot would have had during the Second World War as they approached RAF Bolt Head. It was an incredibly daunting airfield perched right up here on the top of the cliff edge. We're now just turning on his, uh, in flying terms, a right-hand base to line up for the runway which uh, we've just taken off from. This aircraft is very powerful and to get it to slow up is, uh, is quite a difficult task. So we're just turning here, getting ready to line up for the runway. Now this is the view a pilot would have had during the Second World War, lining up to land on this uh, runway. You can bear in mind it was only around about 1,200 to 1,500 metres long during the war. So to land an aircraft, which you had to get down to a landing, you want to be doing 190 now, just as you come over the fence and the aircraft would touch down at about 110 miles an hour. And uh, it's just a phenomenal thing to see how difficult it would have been to land on these short runways. We're just taking off again now and we're going to head out east towards Prawl Point and then make a turn and make an approach to land on the opposite direction. So we'll be landing 
pointing towards the west, having flown out over towards Broad Point. We'll make a turn over the uh, Garrow Rock Hotel and you'll get some of a, a bit of a pilot's eye view of what the approach would have looked like during the Second World War as you approach this cliff top runway. Just directly ahead of us now, this is one of the most southerly tips of the whole of the UK and uh, the aircraft will make a turn just before this now and head back towards uh, Bolt Head. This is a really, truly amazing aircraft. And we're now turning to line up for the runway at the former RF bolt head. And you see the cliff top just in front of us. That's 450 feet above sea level. And the aircraft and the pilot, we have to aim to land just beyond that uh, cliff edge, the row of trees, which would have given us uh, uh, in a very heavy aircraft, it would have just about given us enough time to uh, to pull up and land, as you can see here. When you consider the landing at over 100 miles an hour, it's quite incredible. So this is the approach now to the uh, the wartime runway, which ran directly along here, round about 1,250 metres. As you can see, it's quite a short runway to make an approach to land when you would be doing well over 190 miles an hour at this point to come over the fence at around about 180 and to touch down at 110 it they, they just has incredible courage and again we're just about to take off across in a westerly direction this is the westerly outlook as you take off from RF bolt head across the main runway across the intersection of the two runways and we're just passing out now over the Sawmill Cove Hotel and this is the view a pilot would have had during the Second World War almost exactly the same before they then headed out to sea and they were flying a hundred and over a hundred miles across the uh, English Channel to the northern French coast to uh, to embark on their attacks Possibly the greatest and the most explosive, literally, extra added to the Typhoon's armoury would be the 60 pound rocket and would be released by Typhoons in great waves of explosive rocketry across the sky. A maximum of eight of these weapons could be carried and their primary purpose was for the destruction of tanks and other soft skinned vehicles. The 11th of September 1941 at Duxford Aerodrome in Cambridgeshire. My first meeting with the Typhoon was at Duxford in 1942. We were in the first Typhoon wing and eventually we went on operations, but they were peripheral operations. Uh, they are going mainly along the, the French coast uh, with the object of a, a customer asked to flying in the Typhoon on operations and avoiding, they hoped, and successfully, avoiding an aircraft being shot down and uh, being taken to pieces by the Germans. It was big and, uh, and very, about twice the size of a Spitfire, I should think, uh, and it had uh, very uh, clumsy attributes, such as a, a car-type door and a, a window which could be wound down rather like a car door. So it wasn't a favourable first impression, but uh, eventually we got to find it quite a, quite a, a comfortable machine, although it was um, a very uh, apt to, uh, to um, judder. It happened more than once that a tail came off the machine, and at that time nobody whose tail came off survived. The engine was a Sabre, 24-cylinder. Um, it wasn't reliable. And the consequence was that uh, a number of people had to make forced landings. The 
pilot calmly discusses his ordeal with other members of his squadron. The Typhoon was far more powerful machine than the Spitfire, as you'd expect. There were only, I think, the Spitfire it had a Merlin engine at 12 cylinders, and the uh, Typhoon had a Sabre engine, Napier Sabre engine, with 24 cylinders. So, as you would expect, it was much uh, more powerful and much faster, much higher rate of climb. And, in fact, it was at that time, I think, probably the fastest uh, fighter in the world. It continued to be 12. However, this second option had been removed from the specification as it had been realised that, A, the weight would have been too great, and, B, the time taken to reload these guns after every sortie would have kept the aircraft on the ground for far too long. I flew those for, for months until subsequently I was posted back to England where I joined 198 uh, Fighter Squadron who were flying Typhoons, the Typhoon 1B. A bit of a frightening experience really to start with cause, because the first time that you flew in one was your solo, you might say. Takeoff speed was about 130 miles an hour before she got unstuck. Coming to land, uh, coming over the fence at about 180 miles an hour, 200 to 180 miles an hour, and touching down at about 110. The original batch of Typhoon fighter bombers were uh, fitted with eight brand new machine guns. However, a bigger firepower was needed, a more concentrated firepower was needed, and Although Hispano cannons were, still are one of the best weapons available, there were problems in acquiring enough breech blocks to make these guns available in large enough quantities. However, once this had become available, the next production batches of Typhoons were all going to be fitted with four 20mm cannons, as this would concentrate a large amount of firepower in a small circle in the shortest possible time, thereby causing the most destruction. Except, of course, for the very small batch of uh, fighter reconnaissance aeroplanes where one of the cannons was replaced with photography equipment. We did have a problem with the aircraft engine with uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, it wasn't really the engine, it was the design of the aircraft. Drew the, the engine the cells were forward, as, as is natural, uh, and then the design drew a lot of the frames inside the cockpit. And so we had to fly at all times with, with oxygen. The other snag was that, uh, and I was caught with this once, closing the canopy head. And on the end of your gloves, there was a small tag. And if you weren't careful, you'd catch the tag in the canopy, between the canopy and the, the roof, as it were, and be stuck up there with your hand. And it's not too easy to, to land a, a typhoon with one hand up in the air like this and only one hand to handle everything else. Napier's Sabre was the attempt to bolt two engines together and drive them through a common drive shaft. Unfortunately for everybody concerned, although it looked good on paper, the Sabre would start to suffer from certain problems. The first of these would be problems with the oil feed. This would become clogged and cause the engine to overheat and eventually to seize, causing our intrepid pilot to either abandon his aeroplane or follow it down into the crash landing. Having dealt with the oil feed problem, Napiers have found another one. This would be problems with the seatings of the valves. These had not undergone the process known as nitriding. This meant that there would be build-ups of carbon and metal particles which would cause the valves to malfunction. Eventually, with help from Bolt and Paul, all of these problems would be overcome, although it would take many years before the Sabre would become a reliable engine. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this brief look at the uh, Hawker Typhoon, a very powerful aircraft that was flying from RAF Bolt Head near Solcombe in Devon during June and July 1944. Uh, please have a think about subscribing and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Cheerio for now.